Yeah, guys, so what we're going to do is just go through the process for getting a stockpile volume, just quick and easy. The data we're going to be looking at is from an indoor stockpile. So there's a little bit of a difference, but a lot of the process is going to be the same. So I wanted to thank everybody for joining us. This is the first of what we hope to be a kind of a series of shorter, a little bit more frequent webinars with iSight Studio. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up Studio now, and we'll get started. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and bring the scans into the screen. So like I said, these scans were from an indoor stockpile, and we took these scans with an EyeSight 8200 scanner, so kind of our shorter range scanner. And what we're going to notice first thing right away is that the scans aren't registered. So we were indoors, so the, uh, the onboard L1 GPS was able to get you know, some sort of information, but definitely not accurate, and obviously RTK GPS wasn't an option. So first things first um, is going to be getting the scans registered to each other. And obviously that process is going to be a little different since we didn't have uh, GPS coordinates. So basically the process for that, especially because we just need them to be relative to each other, is picking one scan that's going to kind of serve as our master scan. So for argument's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and pick this first one right here. So I've got everything colored differently so I can see what I'm moving. So I'm going to go ahead and move this second one into place. And what I've got open right now is this freehand manipulation tool. And I'll go ahead and bring that up to the top so you guys can see what I'm doing. So this button right up here along the top starts this up. And, uh, and then basically what I can do with this data from here is I can click on any one of these axes and rotate the data around, which it looks like it's all pretty much level, so I don't want to rotate it. Uh, what I am going to do, though, is just move it into place. So let me make sure I know which one I'm moving it to. Perfect. We're going to lock it on over there. That's pretty close. Let's see if we can fine-tune that a little bit. All right, I'm going to grab my secondary one here. That one needs a little bit more movement. So you can see how having them colored individually definitely makes it a lot easier. And right now I'm selecting this... Uh, this little square down here and that if we zoom in here you can see that's on the uh, you know on the X and Y axis so I'm not actually changing the elevation at all I'm really just moving these into place um, you know along the X and Y axis and we'll we'll deal with the Z here in just a second so there's definitely some elevational issues here so to handle that, I'm going to go ahead and just click on, and what I'm doing is I'm clicking with the center mouse, or the, the scroll on the in the center of the mouse, the scroll wheel, and then that allows me to just move this into place, making sure not to have um, any extra scan selected on the side. So whatever's highlighted in blue over here is what I'm going to be moving. So we just want to make sure that we're moving the appropriate stuff. Slide that up into place. And that's pretty close. I think global registration can take it from here. So again, since we didn't have any GPS coordinates and I moved everything to line up with this top scan, I'm going to go ahead and choose that as my fixed reference data. So this, uh, the information is not going to be in any specified coordinate system, but it's all going to be relative to itself. And this is a nice, tight, you know, enclosed area, so there's lots of overlapping data. So this process should snap into place pretty quickly. We'll go ahead and let that run. There we go. And you can see that that's just kind of fine-tuning everything and locking it into place. I'm going to go ahead and let that run one more time just for, just for good measure. Perfect. Okay, so now that we've got everything sitting where it should be, we've got one cohesive picture here out of those four jumbled scans. Uh, now the first thing we're going to need to do is get rid of that ceiling. Obviously, we just want to get the volume off the data inside. So if I zoom in here, you can see that there's, there's a pile in there, but we want to get rid of all the surrounding data. So basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to get this to a point where I can see the stockpile inside. I'm just going to make sure using kind of my polygonal selection mode that I select outside of the actual stockpile itself. Highlight that information. 
and I'm going to crop the unselected objects. So that's going to get rid of everything outside. There we go. All right. Let's can do a little bit better job. There's uh, quite a bit of dust here, as you can see, so we'll need to make sure we do a good job of getting rid of that. Come in here. I will definitely run a snow and dust filter, but we can certainly select some of it from that view. All right. And by just rotating it around and looking at it from a few different perspectives, it's pretty easy to, you know, go through and get rid of quite a bit of the stuff that we don't want. I definitely want to clip this off the top from the uh, from uh, where the material was coming in. We don't want any equipment to be included in our volume. And I'm going to go ahead and take care of a little bit more of this dust really quickly. When you're up close like this, the snow and dust filter does work pretty well, but especially indoors when it can get incredibly dense, uh, it's not quite the one quick solution that it can be in an open area. All right, so I think we've got that pretty well taken care of. So let's go ahead and run that snow and dust filter, take care of anything that may have been excluded. For anyone that doesn't know, the snow and dust filter is relatively new and it's more or less a combination of two filters. So basically it works by eliminating all the points below a preset intensity, in this case 700, and it only applies that to points within a certain range. So intensity is affected by the color, the size of the material, um, or the size of the particulate itself, as well as the range. So by limiting that range down and then getting rid of everything below 700 uh, value intensity, it does a pretty good job of getting rid of any points that came back on dust that was in the air, snow that was in the air, even thick fog or uh, you know big exhaust plumes out of a piece of equipment. So we'll go ahead and get that filter down. Perfect. Looks like I got a few rogue points off there to the side, so we'll delete those out. So I'm also going to go ahead and run a topographic filter. Uh, that works really well on stockpiles. Basically, the topo filter works the same as the, um, the minimum separation filter, the difference being that I can actually choose to keep the lowest point. So not only do I get to kind of limit down that point density to make a smaller file size on the resulting surface, but I can actually keep the lower points eliminating. Uh, it helps a lot for vegetation, but in this case, any, uh, any dust that may have been missed. So we'll go ahead and filter that down. There we go. So you can see that it definitely did trim it down a little bit, but we didn't lose enough to affect the accuracy of the resulting volume. So now I'm going to go ahead and create a topographic triangulation. We'll bring that up. Definitely want to trim boundary triangles, 50 feet. That's fine. That should be plenty. And we'll just go ahead and name this Pile 1. There we go. So I'm going to right click on that and hide all except for the pile itself. So we can see there's a few spikes on there. We're going to go ahead and get rid of those using the uh, despike option. All right, that looks pretty good. So we're going to go ahead and get a surface volume out of this. So we'll grab that and select the base. And there we go. We've got our volume right out there at the bottom. So it's going to give, obviously, the same output uh, every time. Your volume above your original surface or plane height, and then the volume below. And if we had known the material density, uh, if we had had the opportunity to run a density study, we could input that, and then the output would not only give us the volume in cubic yards or cubic feet, it would also give us the weight of the material. Uh, we didn't have that in this case, so we'll just go with the volume. And there you have it, guys. That's pretty much the process. As you can see, there's a lot of similarities to outdoor stockpiles, um, but the registration process varies a little bit with the lack of GPS. And then, um, you know, a few extra filters, a little bit more manual manipulation involved. But that is pretty much uh, the summary of what I wanted to show you guys today. So we'll go ahead and open it up for a few questions and uh, get those taken care of. Okay, we've got one here. How did you get a volume without a base surface? It looked like you just clicked on the ground. 
Okay, that's a good question. I'm going to bring that tool back up and show you guys exactly what I did there. So in this instance, I didn't need a base surface or an original surface, if you will. Since this was an indoor stockpile, uh, the ground was, it was on a cement pad, so we knew that that was poured perfectly flat. So I selected plain height as opposed to actually creating a polygon and then registering a surface out of that. And then you can manually put in your height here. But again, since we didn't use GPS and it was all relative to itself, I simply clicked on the floor. And then by clicking on that, it grabbed the, the elevation from where I snapped to. So it's definitely not something you'd want to do if there was a slope or an angle involved like there is a lot of times with outdoor stockpiles. But if it's on a cement pad or indoor, a lot of times that's a, a pretty quick way to speed the process up a little more. All right, let's see if we've got another one here. Uh, is it better to have known coordinates in known coordinates to scan from inside the building instead of just having the scans relative? Um, it certainly could be. It would make the actual registration process um, just a little bit quicker because you could register by name with those known coordinates. Um, the downside of having a few specified points inside a building like this would be that uh, your hands are kind of tied as far as where you can set up from. So the shape and the size of the pile is going to vary, um, you know, day by day, week by week. So it'll make the registration process easier, but um, it might force you into scanning from areas that weren't going to be the best areas to set up from. So uh, some positives and negatives depending on how much the pile is going to vary. All right, guys. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. Thanks for writing those ones in. Um, if you guys do have any additional questions, I'm going to go ahead and bring up, uh, bring up Burton and Mine's contact information here. We appreciate everybody logging in. And like I said, we plan to do a few more of these a bit more often. Uh, we're going to have um, you know some shorter, more task-based webinars that are a little bit easier to break away for 10 or 15 minutes. So if you have a question that comes up after the fact or you just want some additional information, uh, feel free to contact us. And uh, there's Burton and myself, uh, our email right there. And you can always reach us at our Denver office, uh, the phone number down there at the bottom. So thanks again for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys for the next one.